Welcome to the Simply Authentic Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to dream bigger, empower you to take charge of your own life, and challenge you to be your most authentic self. to the Simply Authentic Podcast. I'm Angie Mullings. And I'm Tanya Murfin. So we are focusing on women's health. And one of the topics that you don't really hear talked about very often is infertility. And we have a guest in the studio today. Her name is Angela Crawford. And she's going to tell you all about her experience with infertility here in a little bit. I'm first going to read a definition of infertility given to me by the CDC. It is the inability to get pregnant after trying for a year or more. It affects about one in five married women between the ages of 15 and 49 in America. And according to the CDC, infertility can stem from a myriad of conditions from both men and women for both men and women and can cost tens of thousands of dollars to treat. So first we want to welcome our guest, Angela welcome. Crawford. Welcome. And Angela, we're going to start out just by you telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you do for a living and so forth. And then will you get into your story of your own infertility experience? Sure. Uh, my name is Angela Crawford. I am 38 years old. I am a senior financial analyst at Expedia. I use she, her pronouns, and I have been on this infertility journey really well over a decade at this point in time. Um, if you want, I can kind of just where it all began. Sure. Yeah. So my story starts like a lot of couples struggling with infertility, which is that after my husband and I got married, we didn't try to prevent a pregnancy, but we weren't actively trying to get pregnant, mm -hmm. just letting things happen on their own timeline, their own accord. And after about a year or so, we started to more actively try to get pregnant and very quickly realized that this wasn't going well, uh, that things weren't working as supposed to, doing, going online, doing Google searches, and hoping that that will give you some insight. I very quickly jumped in to start setting up medical appointments with my primary, who then got me and set up with an OB, which did some testing. Um, and then uh, ultimately, if the conclusion was, if you are not getting pregnant, really six months of active trying, mm -hmm. but one year of even an unprotected intercourse, you should be pregnant within a year's time. And if you're not, there is likely some type of underlying con condition. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I finally got with my OB, which that whole process takes some time just to become a new patient. I think I had to wait four sure. months just to see that OB. We did some labs, learned out that I had hyper or low progesterone, and she didn't really get into a diagnosis. She started prescribing a, a medication called Clomid, which is very common. You'll see a lot of women take to mm -hmm. help with ovulation. And it did help put certain levels where they were supposed to any given month, but still no pregnancy. And you just get that very narrow window any given month mm -hmm. to the when to try mm -hmm. to become pregnant. Mm -hmm. So after a couple months of that failure, we also went on ahead and did some testing with my husband because male factor is also sure. pretty mm -hmm. prevalent. Yes. Yep. You'll see statistics vary. 20 to 40 percent ish mm -hmm. is what you'll mm -hmm. see uh, the, the the underlying issue is actually male factor right and even though my husband which it took again took a while to line up to get him in with the urologist even though he went in with the concern of like we want to make sure that there's no issues his conclusion was kind of just like eh, take some vitamin d and mm -hmm. just there wasn't a lot of attempt mm -hmm. to solve a problem mm -hmm. that when mm -hmm. we knew there was one mm -hmm. the longer this went on um ultimately i had benefits through my employer which not in all health insurances have this in their plan that would cover IVF and infertility benefits because yeah. they are very costly. Yeah. And as a result, it very much handcuffed me to my employer to retain those benefits mm -hmm. while I was undergoing this treatment. Sure. And that also resulted in me having to meet up with a reproductive endocrinologist, which there are none here in Springfield. You are going to travel to Kansas City, Columbia, Tulsa, or in my case, St. Louis, to find yourself a reproductive endocrinologist, which is what I did. At this point in time, I'm two plus years into this, actively trying to get pregnant. Mm. Do not have any answers. We've had various medications, various things we've tried. Never really had a diagnosis, had labs, had other things done, but we just, nowhere. Once I met with my reproductive endocrinologist and he did a much more extensive questionnaire on my background and my family history, 
He did his own testing and everything very quickly. He decided that it was very likely that I had PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm -hmm. which basically I don't produce mature eggs. I don't ovulate. And so what he was going to do was going to treat towards that as long as everything indicated that. He also, just as a precaution, um, did a dye test on my cervix and fallopian tubes to make sure there was no obstructions in my uterus, that everything was physiologically normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then once he had that kind of ruled out or figured out, that's when we, start, we started treatment accordingly, which began with IUIs, which is intrauterine inseminations. And after that, eventually, if we needed to, we could escalate to IVF, which is obviously the most expensive and invasive, but also the most successful uh, treatment, which is ultimately what we ended up doing. And so we made the decision to do IVF in October of 2015. And I, you were how far in at this point? This yeah. is right around that three-year marker. Three-year, okay. okay. Yeah, my husband and I were okay. married in May of 2011. Okay. Okay. And so after about a year, May 2012 to October 2015, about mm -hmm. three years in at that point, um, that was when at that point in time we pulled this, decided October. It takes a while just to get set up to do this. It takes a lot of time, a lot mm -hmm. of travel to St. Louis, a lot of labs. Um, we had to go through orientation. We had to learn about the different medications. They had to do additional testing on him. They decided that we actually did have a male factor mm -hmm. at some point in time, mm -hmm. enough that they want to do a, a part of our protocol. Our IVF plan protocol would include a procedure called ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Basically, they manually fertilize the eggs. Got it. Um, and so all this from October, I got my positive pregnancy the Friday before Mother's Day weekend. So it was about a seven month process from the moment we decided to the moment that we actually had our first positive pregnancy. So none of this is a fast process. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And everything went great and fine. And January of 2017, brought home daughter and then went back for an embryo transfer, another, because um, we had multiple embryos, mm -hmm. successfully transferred and had my son March 2019. And we still have 11 frozen embryos that we we'll have to make a choice of what to do with those at some point in time, but right now they're just cryopreserved. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Wow, well, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. It and I, it brings up so many questions. I mean, it, like you said, it's not a fast process. So you, you basically weren't, if I understand correctly, you weren't getting a lot of direction from the medical community. You were doing a lot of research on your own, trying to figure out what the next steps were. So you took a lot of this on yourself um, to try and get to an answer. And I think that we've, we've talked to, in the podcast, to several different people about, uh, I don't, I don't want to slam our medical community, but I just want to say, it, you have to be your own advocate. Mm -hmm. We've said that before in the podcast, just, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the problem is. You, you have to become your own advocate. You started this process 10 years ago. Do you know if it's any easier today, if there's an advancement being made in terms of trying to figure out the root underlying problems and, and that kind of thing? The answer is yes and no, depending on kind of how you break down that topic. So in terms of the technology, there is more testing, there is more um, communication, there is more community. So there is mm -hmm. more to kind of give you, not just to advocate, but how to advocate, mm -hmm. what to ask. So that very much exists as far as the barriers and as far as accessing that medical care, it's gotten worse in a lot of ways um, because it is specialized care. And also um, the cost of it is by and large not covered through insurance. So sure. it's coming out of your own pocket. Yeah. Right. So, and the, the gatekeeping is just as, as far as getting to the medicine, the advanced medicine, the, it's called ART, Advanced Reproductive Technology. That is as inaccessible as it's ever been, hmm. but having the tools to have resources and community and knowledge and learning there is a lot more there than there was for me which I'm very grateful for yeah 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 how unusual do you think it is that your insurance company carried a policy on this it's more in common than what I care to think about um, because I have to work for a large corporate employer and so right you very much you have to work for a corporate employer or just get very very lucky because yeah. there are I believe 14, maybe 18 states, there are so many states that are required to carry health insurance that includes reproductive benefits. Oh. And so typically, if a 
company is either headquartered or even, I think, operates in those states, mm -hmm. their plans have to include that. Okay. Oh. Got it. So well, typically if you're working, know. yeah, if you're yeah. working for a national organization, yeah. chances are they will have something for you. Although they could always find ways around it where they incorporate in a state where they don't have to, but sure. that's right. going to be your best bet to be able to get the, have those benefits. Yeah. So in your opinion, you going through your history and all the steps you had to take, and a lot of it, as we've talked about, is self-discovery or was self-discovery, and you just, you know, trying to find out as much information as quickly as you could. What would your first and second step be for the person who has now tried to get pregnant for about a year and unsuccessful? What would you tell a friend? The thing I tell a friend, the thing I tell anyone, whether you're trying to conceive or not, is if any person with a uterus, you need to start, if you do not have a benign 28 day cycle that is uneventful, mm -hmm. talk to your doctor. If you have painful cycles, if you have heavy cycles, if you have irregular cycles, if you have anything abnormal, and there's every chance you will get hand waved away that this is fine, it's normal. Mm -hmm. it's Probably not. There is certain testing they can do because some people have, girls have um, diminished ovarian reserve where they become menopausal a lot younger than what they should. Mm -hmm. and that's a very hard thing to overcome versus some of the other conditions where the treatments exist for it. And so step one is if you do not have a regular cycle and there's something that's not influencing it to be abnormal, talk to your doctor. After that is to find your community um, because I did this all alone. Mm -hmm. It was very isolating. It was very mm -hmm. hard on my mental health. I don't think I've ever been as low as what I was during that time. Mm -hmm. And so I have, as a result, started a support group. And just to give people the benefit of my experiences on who to go to, what to ask, I can't tell you how to get there, but I can give you right. the resources to start having conversations that yeah. I had no idea even how to, like, I didn't even know what the conversations sure. were. Right. Yeah. yeah, I love that you've used the word community two or three times because I, I can't even begin to imagine how isolating it would be. And just the fact that you're not a medical professional, but you are creating community for others because sometimes we the best source of information is just from someone who's been through it. At, at the very least, just having sort of a, a sh uh, you know somebody to compare notes with mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and get in a circle of people who maybe have had different experiences um, just to support each other. Yeah, that's yeah. a big deal. It really but is. Tell us a little more about your emotional health during this and at what point did you realize the toll that it was taking on you and your husband oh i mean i think it's I'm still taking a toll on me sure mm -hmm. i definitely think that to this day it's still a cornerstone of everything i do comes from this foundation that happened during this time mm -hmm. um because in addition to just not having any knowledge not having any not having any control and that's such a foreign yeah. concept mm -hmm. because i can control you really can control almost anything in your life. You can control your finances. You can, to some degree, control things like your weight or your health or your whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of it's much harder to obtain than others, but there are things that you can do to influence and control that. Mm -hmm. There is very, very, very little, if anything, that I could do to control my body's ability to get pregnant because it just hormonally wasn't sure. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as a result... I did the very unhealthy thing, which was to completely ignore and repress and push those motions inside and focus on what I could control, which maybe was healthy. And I worked very hard on my education. I completed my bachelor's. I graduated with honors. I was working full time while going to school full time or near full time. And so because that was something I could control mm -hmm. and have a control in the outcome was not only finish school, but finish and do well at it. So mm -hmm. I was able to graduate with my bachelor's in business administration from Drury University. And that went well. Honestly, when that ended, it kind of left me lost. I didn't know where to go next or what to do next. I didn't have anything to pour that energy into because mm -hmm. I was still just mm -hmm. dealing with a small window of time for treatments in any given uh, cycle. And so my mental health just cratered. Plus, I'm also taking hormones, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're yeah. already not Massive in a good dose. headspace. Yeah. 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 So let's just pour more chemicals onto your <laughs> yes. brain. Yes, yeah. exactly. And you can't have other chemicals poured on your brain because you may become pregnant at any point in time, so you can't mm -hmm. have right. any type of anxiety or depression meds and right. things like that's out as well too yeah. so your ability to try to keep your brain chemistry in line is 
worse than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And yes, I did go and have I did some therapy sessions, and that did help mm-hmm. as far as the catharsis of being able to vomit all my emotions and my feelings. Mm-hmm. Yes, but it definitely there was a point uh, a low. Um, I had a, a niece that was born, and she is the light of my life now. But at the time, it was very hard for me to go see my niece mm-hmm. after she was born. And it was very important to the rest of my family that I be there for her, regardless of what it would do to me. Mm-hmm. And the end result was me crying in a bathroom, catatonic, not able to function, mm-hmm. and then deciding that I thought I could walk home from Nixa to Springfield in the middle of the night in a cold evening in April, barefoot. Mm-hmm. Didn't get very far, had to be put in a car and taken home, but it was just very, very hard to have this thing forever out of reach and being told so many times by so many people well, we can be sad for you but you need to be happy for them mm-hmm. I didn't have that in me mm-hmm. I would much rather been left to be a sad lonely wretched person in my own space like let me go live under my bridge and be a troll mm-hmm. don't try to make me come out into sunlight because it's not going to work mm-hmm. that's even harder on me so try to respect that space and that boundary and again I didn't even know how to articulate this at the time other than I just couldn't say this is sure. really hard I can't do this is really hard for me to do yeah but a lot of that just got hand waved away. And so I've really worked hard to make sure that when people do reach out to me, that they get that permission that I never had, that it's actually okay to be a, a wretched person. Yeah. It is actually, you are not your best self right now. You don't have to be your best self. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just take care of yourself and don't worry about anyone else. Right. Self-care is important uh, in is. any scope of our lives. But when you're going through something very traumatic on your mental health, on your physical health, it is so important to keep self-care in mind. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little more about your support group and what it's called, how someone could find it, and what that's done for you in the community now that's revolving in that. That is one of my silver linings because, as I think was clear, uh, this was the most painful time and period in my life. And for me, I needed as much good as possible to come from such a painful time. And a lot of people say, well, weren't your kids all worth it? There's no worth or value that you mm. assign. They are, they are priceless. Yes, right, completely. But I do want there to be value in those experiences. Mm-hmm. And so I, after my daughter was born, before I had my son, I had was working for someone that had also gone through IVF, and she had said she was in a support group, and I thought, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I would like to give to people that a resource that I didn't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I went looking, and uh, Resolve, resolve Resolve.org is the infertility organization nationally. They advocate Mm -hmm. for access to reproductive uh, care for infertility, Mm -hmm. and all that encompasses. They're the ones going to tell you which states offer benefits, what that looks like. They can talk about, like, different types of treatments, uh, scholarships, different ways to pay for it. Anyway, they also have peer-led support groups, and you can sponsor and start a peer-led support group. So I went that process, went through what they wanted to for me to do a peer-led support group. And so the third Wednesday of every single month at the Library Center here in Springfield, I have a support group from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Although June is going to be kicked out a week because it falls on Juneteenth and the library is closed on Juneteenth. So gotcha. it'll be the following week. We just yeah. figured that out today. Okay. Um, and it has been, I didn't expect for it to heal me. I expected it to be able to help others out so that Mm -hmm. they could just not suffer in the same way that I did or feel as alone as what I did. Mm -hmm. And it has actually been very healing to see people learn from those experiences, to share that, to see that when you're comparing notes, it's like, oh, I did go through that too. Mm -hmm. Oh, you went through that as well. And there's that catharsis and, again, community. Mm -hmm. It's been very good. Even then, even though in my mind in a lot of ways, I'm probably done on my family building journey, I still had, as I said, 11 frozen embryos, so I need to make a choice with those at some point in time. Sure. And it's easier to talk to people that have gone through IVF or have similar experiences mm-hmm. that can have informed thoughts and opinions about what I can do, why should I do it, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. And it's a much better sounding board than trying to talk to someone who has, they just don't even have like the zero starting point that I need them to. You don't have sure. to educate, I don't want to educate you and then ask your opinion. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been very helpful. That, that's Good. amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. You uh, go ahead, Angie. Well, n- no, go ahead. Did you uh, have something well, else I on was that going line? To lead into the you, this whole experience yeah. led you into being a spokesperson for Cox Medical Center, mm-hmm. and also you being involved in other articles that have written been written. So tell us about that and how you 
how you felt, if you fell into that, what that has meant to your journey and, and mm-hmm. being able to be that spokesperson. It, it's interesting because I don't care about fame or notoriety or not having fame or notoriety. Like, I'm happy to be put on a pedestal. I'm also happy to exist in my own quiet space. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason that I started talking about this is because no one else was talking about mm-hmm. this. Right. And as you talk about it and you become visible and you get that platform, that's when people start to reach out to you, whether it's through learning about seeing your contact email, your contact information. And in Cox's case, you know, as I went, especially when I went back for the embryo transfer for my son, it was a lot easier because they'd started to build that relationship so that I could do any labs, by and large, I could do them in Springfield and really only had to go up to St. Louis for the transfer. And so that made it a lot easier because when I went through IVF, I kind of omitted this detail. I had to drive back and forth from St. Louis every other day for about three weeks. Good grief. Mm-hmm. And I was working at the time, right. too. Right, yeah. And just mm-hmm. and taking all these additional hormone shots. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the cannot stress, like, how level of barely functioning you are when that's yeah. all going mm-hmm. on. Yeah. And so at one point in time, Cox reached out and said, hey, we're trying to promote and show our services to – that we have this partnership now with Washington University, which is who mm-hmm. I went to, um, where we can do telehealth visits and everything else. And just kind of asked if I want to do a little interview, do a little video, my cute little newborn son. Perfect. Happy to be your poster mm-hmm. child to make people aware that this service and this partnership exists. Yes. So people like me don't have to do round trips to St. Louis for a blood draw most of the time. No kidding. Right. Yeah. yeah. That seems so simple <laughs> yeah. to have to drive three hours, but you know, um, And I think that's a really important point to make is that you've got two big health um, corporations willing to work together and not Mm -hmm. making it all about them, but really more making it about you to be able to have a televisit. And I know that that's more and more becoming a little more More and more frequent and prominent these days. But what a great relationship that you can now speak to. Mm-hmm. that will help future women and men having to deal with this. It was really nice, too, because when my son was born, my reproductive endocrinologist based in St. Louis was in Springfield and was able to come visit us when he was born because oh. he was meeting with my OBGYN nice. mm-hmm. for consulting with patients, whatever it is that they do, but yeah. he was in the hospital at the time. And so when we were in the hospital and recovering the next day after he was born, he was able to come and see us. And That's that was super cool. Really yes. nice. Yeah. 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 Kind of a bow. Yeah. Put a bow on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How far we exactly. come. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I think we were talking before the podcast started about, um, is it is it that we're hearing more about people having this um, challenge? Is it just that we're becoming more open about having those conversations? Because I, I honestly, I, I have a couple of friends whose daughters have gone through this. I can't say that up until that time I knew anybody who had. So, uh, I, I first of all, I want to thank you for sharing your message and your story mm-hmm. because we do have to make sure that we are tackling these tough co- topics and making sure that we are sharing experiences. And I know it takes a lot to do that. So, thank you for doing yeah. that and Absolutely. for having your um, support group and, and being a resource for people. Um, and. I thought it was interesting that you said that that there was healing for you to be done um, through that, which mm-hmm. is what often happens, right? We we set out to do one thing, and and the side effect of that is that it ends up helping us. Mm-hmm. It becomes a lot more about the journey than the destination. Mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So there's something else that you've been involved with recently, and it is very important to you and also will be to our listeners. So there's a bill that went before the Senate, correct? And so why don't you kind of unpack that and tell us what's beh- what the bill was and what was behind it and what the outcome was? So whether it's at the state or the federal level, level, there has been a lot of legislation around IVF, and adjacent to that is embryo personhood and also abortion rights. Mm -hmm. Um, For the Senate specifically, I believe it's Tammy Duckworth who has really challenged, been been championing this, um, because she herself used um, IVF to have her children. And it is basically to, I believe, probably make it accessible to everyone where 
IVF is part of your, you're, you're guaranteed so many. As it works right now, if you have actually have IVF benefits, you're normally allowed like lifetime lump of 20000 or $30,000. Or mm-hmm. if you use this uh, service called Progeny, you get so many cycles that you're allowed okay. to do this with. But they have lifetime caps, and when they're capped, they're capped. Okay. And I assume that this legislation, if it's like all the other ones that I've seen, I haven't gone into the actual text of it, is typically you're allotted, everyone is allotted so many cycles of IVF or certain allotment of benefits mm-hmm. um, to access infertility services, art, IVF, um, if passed through both the uh, House and the Senate and signed. And I know that that's been legislation that's been introduced in Missouri House as well. Never gone anywhere. But it's mm-hmm. it's my it's my pipe dream. It's it would be the holy grail sure. for me. I would really love to see like that happen because a, there's a lot of people I know that the thing that stands between them and having loved wanted children is yeah. accessing that very expensive care. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so disheartening to to know that there are. I, I looked up some statistics from the World Health Organization, and we were talking again before we started here. But one in one in five, as Tanya said in the beginning, in the United States, one in six worldwide experience infertility. Um, and it has no, it does not discriminate, right? It doesn't matter what your income level is, high, medium, low. It is across the board. And what do these poor couples do that that are on the low end of that spectrum? Mm-hmm. Don't have flexibility with their job to mm-hmm. take a drive somewhere and, and get the treatments. Don't have the financial resources to be able to um, to, to make their dream happen of, of having children. It is just really disheartening. And I, I hope that some, somewhere there's an answer for that. Yeah, and it's oh, this is only going to, I'm not going to say get worse with time. It's only becoming to become more prevalent and visible with time. Um, mm-hmm. Because while it is one in five, one in six couples that struggle with infertility, some of those, the problem is very easily mitigated. It is a medication of this. It is some type of treatment for him. There is some type of surgery, some type of corrective procedure that can be done for him or her, depending on it. So mm-hmm. the level of intervention needed varies. Mm-hmm. Um, but you are seeing more and more people go through IVF because at the end of the day, it is one of the most successful treatment methods. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through this for three years, at some point in time, you just want to go all out and take it to the final degree because you're tired of maybe this month, maybe that month. Exactly. Whereas this has that higher odds of payout. Yeah. Yeah. Or you give up. Or you give up. Exactly. I met that woman too. I have my amazing friend i care very deeply for her she has been through multiple ivf cycles multiple miscarriages Mm -hmm. and she eventually had to decide this is enough i can't keep doing this to myself to my Mm -hmm. husband to our finances yeah uh and she is going to live life that's child free child free not by choice and we do say child free Mm -hmm. we do not say childless because your life is not less for not having children correct it's child free there's there's a freedom to it yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. are there long-term effects that you know of at this point yeah it's one of those there are there there are known um complications uh i don't know if complications is even the word impacts i am more prone to certain types of cancers as a result of taking these meds mm. whereas but like there's everything has side effects like more people die, sure. die of right. Tylenol than what they realize and so i know that i'm sure. more prone to these types of things as right. a result of these medications gotcha. i'm not aggressively worried about that in my mm-hmm. overall health and for me right. knowing it didn't outweigh the benefits yeah of a possible diagnosis sure. here versus having to never get where i wanted to go right so, yeah. right yeah. and again it depends on some for some women the women that have endometriosis getting treatment for the endometriosis which can allow them to get pregnant is an all-around win in their quality of life and everything sure. else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, And we want to remind our listeners, we are not medical professionals and we are not giving medical advice. We are simply telling a story yes. that is real life. So mm-hmm. we want you to understand that and we want to make that disclaimer. Yeah. Tell us about your two children. They're the best. <laughs> I have two wonderful children. They are now five and seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alexandria is... She, so we did find out that she's autistic, and that's just because her mannerisms are so interesting. As far as she's a very literal child, mm-hmm. she does not pick up on sarcasm, but she retains so much information that when she shares when she shares things with you, it's so honest and earnest, mm-hmm. and she is bright and radiant and just a lot of fun to be around. Mm-hmm. And when she tells you that she loves you, it's real yeah. because it's not something she would say if it wasn't. For sure. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas my son Griffin is this dynamic theater kid energy. He's very performative. He Mm -hmm. wants to talk to anyone and everyone. Gives the sweetest platitudes. He's very excited about going into kindergarten. He's very excited (laughs) about being in summer school. His best friend is in a summer school class. He just likes to share his soul with everyone. That's they're, awesome. They're so fun and so funny. Sweet. Well, yeah. you're blessed. That, yes. And you've been blessed to be on this journey. So mm-hmm. obviously we all know that it's the trials and tribulations in life that lead us to the best places because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't know what was the, on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. So um, I commend you for sticking with it and, and for now sharing your story yeah. because I think it's important for men and women both to right. hear you and hear you talk about it freely and say there's, you know, there's help, there are advocates out there, mm-hmm. support groups, all the things now for people to get the right help when they need it. There is hope. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you for being here. And yes, thanks, we appreciate Angela. you sharing your story. And we also want to thank Gershman Mortgage for allowing us this beautiful podcast room to yes. bring you um, our podcast every week. Thanks, Gershman. Thank we'll you. see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Simply Authentic podcast. Be sure to hit follow so that you can see each episode as it pops up weekly. Mm-hmm.